This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st Century. We All Be is under once again heaven on the one and only Dr. Umar Johnson to talk about his career and what's going on in the world today. How you doing today, sir? All is well, my brother. Greetings again. Last time we were in Knoxville, Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> now we're in Little Rock, Arkansas. That was the University of Tennessee. This is HBCU, Philander Smith College. This is my last lecture uh, of the season. I'm going to take a one or two month break into the summertime to recharge, renew, refocus, reorganize. So somebody, my mom asked you a great question. Like, what got you involved in this work? Uh, if I go back to the beginning, we had a mandatory black history class in fourth and fifth grade. Ms. Green was the teacher. And I think Ms. Green kind of ignited in me a passion to know thyself. I got into a black history oratorical contest. It was my first one. I won first place, and I've been speaking ever since. In the sixth grade, my father took me to my first family reunion, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and we were walking through this church, I believe it was, and in the backyard there was a whole bunch of Frederick Douglass memorabilia, pictures, clothing, Bibles of Frederick Douglass, and I asked my father, why is all this Frederick Douglass memorabilia here? And he said, because you're related to him. Mm -hmm. So fourth and fifth grade black history class, coupled with finding out that I was related to Frederick Douglass in the sixth grade, I think that gave me the foundation. Um, obviously, being related to someone of that stature has given me an obligation uh, that you know, I feel I need to own up to, to live up to, not to let him down, to finish his work. Uh, you know, Marcus Garvey and Frederick Douglass, those are my two greatest male heroes. Mm -hmm. And so they the standard that I judge myself by. Always falling short because their shoes cannot be filled. Uh, but I think it was elementary school in those two experiences, black history class and finding out that I was related to Frederick Douglass that kind of got me started. Now, when I became a school psychologist, which was somewhat by accident because I was always a clinical psychologist major, never really into the school thing. I found it by accident. It just so happened at Millersville University in Pennsylvania, where I did my undergraduate work, they had a school psych program. Mm -hmm. So when I returned there for graduate study, I said, let me check this out. So I got involved into it. I knew nothing of special ed, nothing of the learning disability. I never had these problems as a child myself. So I would have to say that there was a little bit of divine design in all of this, some ancestral uh, programming, if you would. Because in becoming a school psychologist, I came face to face with the war against black boys, the school to prison pipeline, the special ed and ADHD conspiracy. So I would say that in becoming a school psychologist, there was a perfect marriage between my passion and my oratory and my needing to have a purpose and serve our people with one of the biggest problems our people suffer from, which is the miseducation machine. Because a lot of activists, a lot of organizers, they don't necessarily... Uh, participate in a profession that is critical in understanding the black reality. In other words, they might be an architect, which is still beneficial, but it doesn't feed directly into a problem area for black people. Education feeds directly into a problem area for black people, and special ed in particular. So with me becoming a school psychologist, that really, really helped make my life relevant to our people. That's excellent. And speaking of, you know, miseducation, that's what I'm thinking about liberation. Like right now, we're in the state of Arkansas. This is the home state, so to speak, of Hillary Clinton, who's the front runner uh, Democratic candidate for president. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of our people, we still believe that, you know, we need a, need a white savior mm -hmm. to save us. And we look at this political season, it's like a lot of black folks are going for, they look, still look for white folks to bail us out. Can white folks liberate black people? White folks will not liberate black people. White folks are not interested in liberating black people. Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. is gonna do just what her husband did, which was fool you into thinking they care about you while they work against your own best interests. Look at Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. He swelled up the jails, cooked millions of black women off of welfare, public assistance, aid to families with dependent children, gave us mandatory three strikes and you're out. Mm -hmm. Now it is true that the United States Congress was predominantly Republican at the time of Clinton's presidency. However, these are initiatives that he championed. Clinton championed kicking black women off of uh, welfare. Clinton championed mandatory minimum sentences. President Clinton championed uh, the three strikes in y'all rule. So this is what her husband did. So imagine what she's gonna do the same thing. We have to stop looking for white saviors. 
we got to understand something. The politics ain't going to save black people anyway. Right. Black people have to save themselves, and they can only do that with a solid political, economic, cultural, and spiritual program, period. You can vote all your life, and nothing will change. Government is designed to perpetuate the status quo. Mm -hmm. Black people are on the bottom of that status quo. So nothing you do, nothing you vote for is going to change that. If you want to change it, you have to change it yourself. Organizing our money, building our own infrastructure, financing our own agenda, that's the way out of this. Not voting for white folks to go in and perpetuate white supremacy. See, when you vote, you don't vote for policy anyway. The policy is already in place. Mm -hmm. Policy is given to the president. President don't come up with the policy. They give Obama the policy. They give Clinton the policy. They give Bush the policy. The people chose you, but this is what you're going to do. So when you vote, you don't vote for a policy. You vote for the personality right. who you want to implement the policy. In other words, do black people want a black man implementing the white supremacy? Do they want a white woman implementing the white supremacy? Do they want a white man implementing the white supremacy? You choose the personality. That's all you choose. You choose who's going to oppress you. But you're going to be rep oppressed regardless. And I think that's kind of sick that you even care for the person who's going to be responsible for the white supremacy. Why would you care? Why does it matter who the warden is at the jail? Wow. The warden's job is to keep you in jail. So does it matter who the warden is if they're all going to do the exact same job? It doesn't make a difference. Well, actually, it's not, so how should we judge the legacy of Barack Obama as it relates to black people? Well, for me, he's a complete failure. He's, the, he's a complete failure. He ignored black people while he took care of every other non-white minority in the country. Uh, placated lesbians, placated Latinos, placated white females, placated Asians, placated illegal immigrants. He took care of every non-white demographic in the country but us. To me, he's a total failure. And not because he didn't change anything. Right. He can't. But because he didn't give voice to my situation. That's my problem. As the President of the United States, you could have at least spoken to the structural inequalities that African Americans face. He didn't even do that. Wow. You know, I have a problem with the fact that you can call a black male homosexual on the phone because he went public with being gay in the NBA or the NFL. They get a phone call from Obama. Being gay, you get a phone call. You're the first black NFL athlete to openly pronounce your homosexuality. You're the first black NBA athlete to openly pronounce your homosexuality. But when Trayvon Martin got murdered, you didn't call his mother. When Sandy Hook happened, you went up there and went to the school. You met with the parents of those white kids who got murdered in Sandy Hook. You didn't call Michael Brown's mother on the phone. You didn't call Eric Garner's wife on the phone. You didn't call Sandra Bland's people on the phone. You see that? So you can get a, you can call people when they gay. You can call white kids when they get shot up. But when black kids get shot up, they don't get no phone call. They don't even get roses from you. Max, this should black folks fear Donald Trump or what? You know. I don't want us to fear anything or anybody because fear paralyzes action. But Donald Trump, again, it's no different. No matter who wins, the policy is the same. The illusion is that you're gonna get a different reality if you vote for the Democrat versus the Republican. Right. The illusion is you're gonna get a different reality if you're voting for a Donald Trump versus a Ben Carson who just dropped out the race today, by the way. Mm -hmm. well, that's the illusion. See, in order for democracy to work, you gotta make people think it matters. You gotta make people think it matters voting. You gotta make them think that. That's the only way you can hold a democracy together. It don't matter who wins. The policy is going to be the same. If Hillary wins, if they won three wars next year, it's going to be three wars, whether it's Hillary the, Rep the Democrat or Trump the Republican. It, it matters not who sits in the office. The policy is already set for the next four years. I know your thing, your wheelhouse is education. And so I read somewhere somebody said that the charter schools is, 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 is the next bubble. The pop is not the housing bubble. You think that's correct? Uh, well, depending on what they mean by that, well, what's going to pop is public school. Charter school's job is to eliminate public school. The charter schools were started to cipher the money and the students out the public school system, depopulated enough, defunded enough, where the public school system collapses on its own, which I agree with. In the next 10 years, you're going to have a total charter school system, and then once all the schools become chartered, they're going to become uh, private, which means you're going to have to pay. It'll still be called charter, but it's going to operate like a private school, and you're going to have to pay tuition. So America is going back to the early days of the republic where your child didn't get an education unless you could afford it. It's coming. There's a movement to eliminate public education in America because half of the white families in this country either don't have children or don't send their kids to public school. So they don't understand why the tax money is going to pay for education when the United States Constitution doesn't even mention the word. There's no right to learn. The right to learn is not in the Bill of Rights, it's not in the preamble, it's not in the Constitution. Education is a state right 
a local function. It's a federal interest, but it's not a federal right. Remember, United States Department of Education was open in the 80s. It's a fairly new federal uh, bureaucracy. It's only since the 80s. It's new. So a lot of people want to get rid of it. And also, in closing, if you have anything you want to share with people or we need to touch upon, get us to think about what's going on right now? Um, I would say this. Okay. Until black people learn to hate racism more than they hate each other, we'll never solve our problems. Our hatred for each other is 20 times what it is for racism. A cop can kill a black boy, we might march for the day. But that's it. We'll fight black people to the end of time. Black people love conflict with other black folks. Hmm. They love it. Most of the TV shows, the reality shows is based on conflict. The movies based on conflict. Rap music based on conflict. We love the music based on conflict. We love conflict. Black people love nothing more than hating down, gossiping about, and working against the best interests of the black folks. And white people know we hate each other more. Until you hate racism more than each other, nothing will change. Dr. Johnson, we thank you so much, and the words are great to go to. Oh, wait, hold on, I want to ask you this. Mm -hmm. you, now, your ancestor is the great Frederick Douglass, right? And I know you, you're against mixed marriages, correct? Yes. So how do you justify him being the great black I don't lady? justify. Okay, so you don't... He had no business marrying a white lady. Okay, no, wrong. Ask you. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't serve to undo the good he did. <laughs> right, right, right. But without question, I don't agree with that. All right, cool, I just want to ask you, people talk about uh, that term. Not, there, yeah, it's right not there. acceptable. All right, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Words, you. Do you. We love you, man. Keep on thank producing you. and pushing.